The Grumman F4F Wildcat is often maligned and criticized for being little more than a flying tally mark for Japanese pilots in the early stage of the Pacific Theater, citing the fact that the Zero was a statistically and technologically superior aircraft. Yet, by the end of the war, for every Wildcat shot down, it destroyed seven enemy aircraft, Zeros included, and was in production until the very end of the war. So, which version of history is true? Was it flying target practice, or an actually, statistically, effective naval fighter? Let's take a look. The Wildcat's beginning is somewhat drawn out and convoluted. Originally, the Wildcat began life as a simple up-engined F3F, called the XF4F-1. It still retained the biplane configuration and cowling-mounted machine guns, and retractable landing gear design Grumman was now famous for. But the US Navy wanted monoplanes. They were in the process of modernizing, and with the march of technology, a biplane was seen as impractical for a frontline fighter. So, the Navy chose Brewster's Buffalo, and Grumman got about making a monowing prototype to compete. It took two attempts to get something worthwhile with the XF4F-3. Powered by a supercharged Pratt & Whitney twin wasp and armed with four M2 Brownings in the wings, the earlier cowling mounted armament having been scrapped, the F4F-3 was adopted and put into production, having even received an order from France that would go to Britain after France fell in 1940, with the British giving the F4F-3 the name Martlet. Martlets would perform convoy protection from escort carriers and be an effective counter against JU-88s and Falkwolf 200 Condors during the Battle of the Atlantic. In U.S. Navy service, the Wildcat would replace the Buffalo completely, leaving the Marines with the lion's share of Brewster's fighter, until they later got Wildcats as well. In the Battle of the Coral Sea and later at Midway, pilots soon abruptly discovered that their main rival, the Zero, held all the cards in an aerial duel. Jimmy Thatch is quoted as saying, The F-4F airplane is pitifully inferior in climb, maneuverability, and speed. This was made even worse when Grumman came out with the F-4F-4, which included a very innovative stowing design that allowed four F-4s to be stored in the same space as two F-3s, but also included two extra guns without any increase in ammunition, meaning more weight for less firing time. Thatch especially loathed the F-4, stating, A pilot who cannot hit with four guns will miss with eight, the original incentive to increase armament being from the British. But why was the Wildcat so heavy? Why was it so chunky compared to the Zero? The short version is that the Wildcat was built to be rugged and strong, to survive green pilots slamming a Wildcat on a carrier deck, which meant a heavy airframe. The Zero, in contrast, was built to be as light as possible to give it the best possible performance in a dogfight but this came at the cost of protection of any kind, meaning that where the rugged and strong airframe of the Wildcat could take a hit and limp home or at the least save the pilot, the Zero, upon receiving the same hit, would, well, explode, often violently, immolating the pilot along with it. The Wildcat's weight did, however, give it one quirk over the Zero, in that it could dive faster than it, which led to boom and zoom tactics being employed with sufficient early warning detection. Jimmy Thatch would even contribute to the improvement of tactics with the Thatch Weave maneuver, which became the go-to maneuver of U.S. Navy pilots in fighting the Zero. Come 1943, with the Battle of Guadalcanal underway, the Wildcat would begin to be replaced on mainline U.S. carriers with first the Hellcat, another Grumman aircraft, and later the Vought Corsair. Though retired from mainline carriers and fighter duties, the U.S. at this point was churning out a metric ship-ton of escort carriers that needed aircraft complements, and there were other roles that the Wildcat could flex itself into to stay relevant, such as bombardment of shore positions and anti-submarine operations. It was also in this year that production switched from Grumman, who was now busy making the Hellcat, to General Motors, who continued producing the Wildcat for both the U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps, and Fleet Air Arm until the war's end. Designated the FM-2, GM's Wildcat was a bit of a hot rod with a stronger engine, taller tail to counteract the torque, and returned to form of four machine guns instead of six, making it one of the best performing Wildcats variants produced out of the nearly 8,000 created. When Japan surrendered and World War II ended, the Wildcat would be retired completely, and Grumman would go on to continue making amazing fighters for the US Navy until their merger with Northrop in 1998. As for today, there are 44 known surviving airframes today, with about half of them being airworthy FM-2s that survived the war. Though seen as a poor fighter and criticized for its shortcomings, it should be noted that the Wildcat did not have a fair matchup. 
The Zero it fought was a leapfrog in capabilities for naval fighters provided by Jiro Hirokoshi's genius design work. The Wildcat was a good fighter for its time, it's just that the Zero was an outstanding one and made the Wildcat look bad. Yet, in spite of the Zero's advantages, the Wildcat was able to usually hold its own and remain relevant throughout the entire war. Not something that can be said of the Zero, which by war's end was outdated, outperformed by newer American aircraft, and most critically, heavily outnumbered. So, back to the original question earlier. Which version of history is true? Was the Wildcat a good fighter, or was it flying target practice? I think, much like many things in life, the answer is a bit of both. Yes, the Wildcat had flaws and came up short against the Zero, but it also had good merits. It had competitive range off of carriers, could fly off of shorter carriers, and kept its pilots alive unlike its Japanese counterpart. I believe personally the Wildcat's flaws have been overplayed, leading to many to forget the fact that it survived the majority of early fighting despite everything, and proves that you don't have to be as good as the other fighter to win, just good enough on your own to survive. <laughs>